The International Criminal Court has today issued an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin, citing war crimes that have taken place in Ukraine since the Russian invasion a little over a year ago. Author and journalist Zarina Zabriskie has spent the last year in Ukraine documenting the war. She joins me now. Zarina, tell me a little bit more about what this arrest warrant entails. Right, George. Um, today is a pretty important development because the International Criminal Court in The Hague uh, has publicly announced uh, issuing the arrest warrants for two people, uh, the Russian Federation President Vladimir Putin and his main human uh, rights, children's rights specifically representative, uh, Maria Lvova Belova. Uh, and uh, while um, many would dismiss it as a, a warrant that could not lead to an actual arrest, it is really meaningful because uh, the, according to the Roman statute, 123 countries now have the right to arrest uh, these individuals uh, if they decide to travel to these uh, countries. Uh, so uh, there's a particular crime that is listed on the warrant, and that is for allegedly transferring and deporting the population, specifically children, uh, and unlawfully transferring them from the territory of Ukraine to the Russian Federation. Uh, and this is the one particular crime uh, that is now uh, being uh, already uh, put in action, because there are a number of war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, genocide, that the International Co Criminal Court can potentially uh, pursue and issue further warrants. And this is what the international experts uh, on law are talking about at this moment today. Tell me, what are some of these, obviously there's the, as you say, the kind of transfer of, of children that's on the warrant. What are some of the other war crimes that there's evidence of that have been happening that may well uh, be uh, make an appearance on, on future warrants? Right, George. Great question, because there are a number of them, starting with the crime of aggression, which many countries want to uh, put uh, on the table, and that would be a major uh, discussion. That would be great if it's possible. It's too big to discuss now, and it's not happening yet. But there are other war crimes and crimes against humanity that are very, very uh, doable, so to say, because there's a number of evidence uh, such as attacking civilian infrastructure, critical infrastructure, of which we have so many examples, uh, say, um, power um, and heat uh, production facilities in the middle of the winter, water pipelines, cutting water supply to cities and towns. Uh, so uh, attacking civilian and residential areas, that's the war crime. Then uh, murder and torture of civilians on a mass scale, and that's uh, mass graves that we have been investigating uh, lately with Byline TV, as you know. Um, there's also uh, using uh, weapons that are banned by Geneva Conventions and other conventions against civilians, uh, such as phosphorus bombs or uh, light projectiles, cluster munitions, and so forth. And we also have some evidence on that. Uh, for Byline TV. Um, uh, and uh, there, there is torture in particular that I have been investigating and writing for, for Byline Times. And this is just some of them. There's also genocide on the table. Uh, but for now, just as with the uh, crime of aggression, we don't have much of the development, but I think it's good to list it. Speaking of mass graves, um, this is something that's been becoming more and more of a story as the war's gone on. Uh, I believe you were there when um, one of these mass graves bodies were exhumed. Tell me a little bit about that. 
Yes, George. Uh, I have been to several mass graves uh, exhumation. Um, the biggest one in particular in the Zoom, uh, 447 bodies. Uh, overall, and by now, I think the number is nearing 900. Um, I was there on September 17th when bodies were uh, exhumed, taken from the graves where they were um, for several months, uh, buried during the time of the Russian occupation. Uh, and. Um, I interviewed the chief of police of Kharkiv Oblast, and he told me how the police in the area came to know about these uh, graves. They were going to people's uh, houses, to the residents, and talking, just checking, um, you know, who is still here, who is still alive. And uh, one by one, people were saying that we know that our loved ones are missing, and we're pointing at this pine a forest right next to Zoom. There, there are houses right next to this forest where we were, uh, where I was in September, and then later we visited uh, with Byline TV. And uh, the day I have arrived there, they were finishing the exhumation. Uh, there were about 17 bodies exhumed on that day. Um, the smell, George, was unbearable. The, this was one of the most horrible experiences that I had in during this year. Um, this indescribable uh, soup of the air that just you cannot escape. We all wore masks, but um, the, the, there's something that happens to your brain when you're exposed to that uh, the, the smell of decay and human flesh. And it's even worse than sight. And the sight was horrendous. And I saw several uh, professional uh, diggers, you know, the grave diggers who had to leave and stay for a few minutes looking into the space because the, the, the sight was just so unbearable. Tell me a little bit more about the people um, in, in these graves. What, how how did they how did they come to be right there? so while uh, right so while there were some uh, people who were the victims of airstrikes or shelling artillery fire there were a number of people and I was present at the exhumation of the grave when one of the victim of torture was exhumed and um, their uh, arms were tied behind the back. Uh, and there were uh, multiple uh, injuries and there were bullet holes in the skull. Uh, so what would happen during the exhumation, there would be uh, war crime prosecutors recording all of this, taking photographs, and then the bodies were sent to Kharkov um, in refrigerator trucks for DNA uh, analysis and further identification. Uh, and most of these bodies were civilians. There were a few children bodies. I've seen them carrying them in black bags. Uh, and it was overwhelming. I mean, it's massive. Imagine, right? It's 500 people, basically. Um, and that that would be war against humanity in one of the war crimes because these people uh, didn't do anything but live in in their houses and but when their their town was occupied by invaders. You've obviously you've been uh, in Ukraine for over a year now. What's the impact that this has on the people of Ukraine on the civilians as they're finding out that they're loved ones, uh, people just like them in other towns and cities not far from them and across the country are being killed in this way and buried in mass graves? It's very hard. It's a um, mix of emotions uh, for those who survived these times in occupied territories. It is, of course, fear because this is one of the reasons why it's done, uh, it's using fear as a leverage to control population in the occupied territories. Because when you know that your neighbor or your loved ones are being killed for no crime at all, just walking in the street, uh, you are less likely to resist, you are less likely to express uh, pro-Ukrainian sentiment, 
Oh, that's number one. And when I talk to people in Izum and I talk to people in other villages uh, and towns like Baradyanka or villages in Kherson uh, Oblast where these mass graves were found, people were still afraid that the Russians might come back and simply kill them. Um, and it's hard to watch. It's, it's hard to witness that. There's also a lot of anger. Um, because in some of these areas, people were Russian speaking, uh, and they actually had quite a favorable view of the Russians. And uh, many times people couldn't believe uh, that, that the so-called brotherly people would come and torture, rape, kill, uh, and do this to to the peaceful population. So there's this mix of uh, emotion leading to hatred at this point. Um, and yeah, very, very difficult mix. And finally, Zarina, uh, the Kremlin have responded to this warrant, uh, I, I believe referring to it as toilet paper uh, and saying that, you know, it, it, it has no value. Russia obviously isn't subscribed uh, to the ICC. What is the impact, uh, do you think, going to be for Russia? Uh, will this change anything? Well, that, that was Medvedev, and he, of course, you know, infamous for such kind of statements. Um, there were a number of other statements equally uh, bewildering, such as uh, Simonian's, uh, Margarita Simonian, who is the head of RT, the chief editor, who said that basically the country which will try to arrest Putin will be nuked in eight minutes. Uh, and uh, I will not list everything of what came out of them in the last hour. Uh, but what it really means is that Putin cannot travel very much uh, because 123 countries that ratified the Roman uh, statute uh, will be obliged to arrest if he so decides. Uh, it also means that uh, leaders of other countries will think twice now before arriving to Russia and negotiating with him or simply standing next to him or shaking his hand because he's now officially a war criminal. Uh, so that puts a question mark on, for somebody like Macron or Scholz, who tend to have lengthy telephone, otherwise conversations with him. Uh, I know that people are already questioning whether uh, the Chinese leadership will continue with their plans to visit Russia and so forth. Well, basically, it is a very clear statement uh, that Russia is recognized as a, a war criminal country. Putin is recognized as a war criminal. And it is, uh, according to many experts uh, I see um, speaking now and somebody I talked to, just one of the f one of many warrants that will uh, soon follow. And we sure hope so, because uh, as we have mentioned, we've been also reporting and investigating, and we have many proofs that these war crimes and crimes against humanity, in fact, happened. Zarina Zabriski, thank you very much. Thank you, George. Caitlin Robertson is a Byline TV producer. He spent the last month in Ukraine with Zarina John Sweeney and Paul Conroy making a documentary uncovering evidence of the war crimes that are taking place in Ukraine. Kaylin, tell me a little bit about the war crimes that you've seen, that you've documented for this film. We found a huge amount of evidence of war crimes. Actually, this specifically was found in a village near Kherson, a civilian village where there was no military activity. This is white phosphorus. We had it checked out with a military intelligence expert. It burns at about two and a half thousand degrees Celsius and it comes out at night. The military should be using these things to apparently illuminate areas so that they can see certain targets on the other side of uh, military lines. But Russia has started to use these incendiary weapons and indiscriminate weapons against civilians all over Ukraine for the last few months. We've spoken to so many people in this country who have showed us videos from their cell phones that they filmed from windows of this stuff raining down. It burns through human skin. It burns through metal. 
and it uh, destroys everything it comes into contact with. It's against the Geneva Convention, it's against almost any human rights act that's ever been written, and it constitutes a war crime. We went through all the villages that we found evidence of this stuff being used in, and there was no signs of military activity. It's used against human beings and civilians. And it's used as a tool of fear and terror. Um, and that's what the Russians have been doing from day one. And it's not just that, it's also torture. The documentary we've been doing with John Sweeney here in Ukraine has been looking at torture victims and the way that regular civilians, not even associated with the military, have been dragged into torture chambers and put through utter hell in this country. And it's been going on since the start of the invasion. Caitlin Robertson, thank you very much. Byline TV is subscriber funded, which means we don't have billionaire backers. But we also don't have press barons telling us how to report things, what we can report. It means that we can stay truly independent and accountable to you. So if you're not yet a member, please go to byline.tv forward slash join. And not only will you get loads of perks through Byline TV Plus, you'll also be helping us to build a better media. Thank you.